Welcome to episode 10 of the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast. The Ministry of Motion Pictures exists to advance the art of Christian filmmaking. I'm animation director and filmmaker Todd Schaefer and your host. New York Herald Tribune! New York Herald Tribune! Est-ce que tu m'accompagnes, Aaron? We're going to do something a little different in this episode. We're going to get a practical crash course on the French New Wave. And I know some of you are asking why. But the reason is simple. The French New Wave, in my opinion, offers a near-perfect role model for advancing the art of Christian film. Christian filmmakers have always felt themselves to be on the margins of cinema, and so did most of the French New Wave filmmakers. Christian filmmakers feel unsupported, and believe they face an impossible task with impossible limitations. But so did the French New Wave. But guess what? The filmmakers of the French New Wave revolutionized cinema. They told their stories their way with very little intervention. Their stories and methods were completely unorthodox and sometimes scandalous. And they did so with meager budgets, industry resistance, and limited options for distribution. And to top it off... Their films were made in the French language, and they created what is arguably the single most significant revolution in the history of cinema. My guest in this episode has written one of the most lively, insightful, and readable books on the French New Wave, and is titled A History of the French New Wave. He's the Wheatley Professor of the Arts at the University of Georgia, and he teaches film history and theory. And his name is Professor Richard Newpert, and I am so excited to have him on this podcast. You know, I think I think we're in that age where things are changing. You look at Netflix, and Netflix yes. is bringing in lots of filmmakers and yeah. giving them no no criticism, no parameters whatsoever, and they're just running wild and making films. And, True. Um, you know, it's an environment that I find is similar to the new wave, where the youngsters and the and the filmmakers are given a lot of freedom that, that they didn't normally have. No, that's true. And I got to say, I mean, I, I don't really put a lot of sort of weight always in what, yeah. what, what the Ken Wars do. But uh, Roma, like to me, is a perfect example. When you met, mentioned Netflix, uh, was a perfect example of something that's independent and new and different and just really impressive. Yeah. So I yeah, get to, it's, yeah. It's an exciting I, luckily, new age, I think, that, uh, that we're yes. getting into. Yes. It's it's challenging because the old yeah. financial models are different, and so oh, it's tough. It, it I help run a movie tough. theater. I, I help run our nonprofit movie theater in town, and it's very difficult because new movies will be coming out, and then suddenly you'll say, "Oh no, that's Amazon, so it won't run in a theater. Yes. We can't show it." Or like Roma, we got to open it uh, in Athens for that that one week. They allowed a one week window around the country so they could qualify for Academy Awards, but Netflix then wouldn't let you run it two weeks. We could have packed the house for a month. Oh, wow. Uh, So they only, they limited the run, but I got to meet uh, Alfonso Cuapon at the premiere at Telluride last fall. And and he said, you know, no studio would touch my project. And Netflix stepped up and they didn't care what I did. And so anyway, so it is a different world. It's challenges many of the established distribution and exhibition yeah. things uh, on the other hand yeah there's just a lot of more options and a lot more options for filmmakers tell me a little bit about yourself and then why you are fascinated with the french new wave sure i um i, I grew up in the midwest you know and my parents never went to college my you know they couldn't believe i wanted to go to movies um but i was fascinated with french film early on i think for we used to have in the old days this is in the 70s when i was an undergrad uh, I went to the University of Wisconsin. We had lots of different um, film societies on campus. So on like a um, Tuesday night, you would go to, the, to you know, the, where they normally had an econ class during the day, and for a dollar, you'd watch movies. And there were a bunch of them simultaneously around campus. So you could, on a given night, on a Friday night especially, you could watch a Fellini movie, a Eric Romer movie, a Jean Renoir movie. You could watch oh. some old classic Hollywood the Casablanca type things. Anyway, so it was somehow the French stuff attracted me. I took French as a language, uh, as an undergrad, had no idea what would become, what would come of that. Um, and finally, it was a French professor of mine when I was just about to graduate in, in um, journalism and mass comm, uh, but I was uh, doing a French equivalent of a minor, and she said, you go to all these French movies, why don't you go to film studies? I'm like, you can do that? 
Um, <laughs> and, and luckily at Madison, they had a number of u- new young faculty. Uh, many of your listeners might know of David Boardwell and Kristen Thompson. They have the biggest selling film art book that most schools use for their intro class and their history classes. So I went over there and went to grad school in Madison. And luckily I had a French professor in, who did French film and he got me a grant to go to Paris for part of my wow. um, PhD work. So I went, spent a year in Paris and I got to study with uh, some of the best people in the world, Christian Metz and, and, and others who became my friends. Um, they were also young kind of, so it's great because in film studies, unlike some fields, a lot of the top people in the field were like in their forties. Uh, 30s and 40s, so they weren't that much older than me in my 20s. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, so I went to Paris. I got to go to the Cinematech regularly and see all kinds of things. And yeah, the the new wave just always struck me as something that was most vibrant kind of cinema. It was challenging and kind of comfortable at the same time. I was going to write my dissertation on it, and then I had a friend. I had met some guy in France who's who was you know I I was so impressed by him, and he said, "Oh, this is my dissertation. I'm writing this." at NYU or somewhere. And so I thought, oh, I can't do it, a guy from the Midwest. So I left it alone and I did something else. And then he never finished his dissertation. He never wrote the book. Um, so it was only later I thought, well, there's still no good book on the new wave. So I got more interested. Oh, fantastic. And it's a very good book, by the way. No, oh, thank you. And, and I must say, one of my professors there, Michel Marie, uh, later then wrote also a book on the French new wave. So I ended up translating that for him into English. Uh, so I did have a great professor over there who, who did care about the new wave, especially for sound and other aspects of it. Um, yeah, Michel Marie's uh, new wave, he tries to prove that it's like an artistic school, that it's really equivalent of you've got a, a ringleader in Francois Truffaut, you've got a sort of theorist in André Bazin and his writings, and you're reacting against the establishment. So he kind of said it's like almost every art movement, if you look at art history, that there's always, whether you're the natu- natu- uh, naturalists or whether you're symbolists or whether you're surrealists, you're always reacting, or impressionists or post-impressionists, you're always reacting against somebody. Right. And he says the French New Wave was reacting against mainstream European and especially French tradition equality cinema, and that right. it's very similar to other art movements. So, he's, so it's actually a very fun book. That's very fascinating. Why don't you elaborate a little bit on that, about the background of the whole new wave movement at sure. that time? Sure. And, and a lot of this really is a, a, a bringing together of a bunch of different forces. I just I always tell my students, it's not like a couple of guys came along and started the French new wave. Uh, there really was a cultural context. And since World War II, there was this sort of kind of disgust with the past and, a bun- and a really a, an emphasis on youth. Um, and a lot of young people in their teens and early 20s uh, started to see cinema as something that was, you know, not their daddy's art form. It was something new and different. Um, but there were cine clubs, these uh, groups, and people, anybody on the street could really start one. But especially cr- film critics would start a, a cine club and say, okay, on every other Tuesday at a certain theater, we're going to show an old movie and we'll talk about it. And that really helped pr- help build an audience who would be really kind of, you know, caring about, about aesthetics, and they'd argue about things. And a bunch of new journals came out in the 1950s in particular, early 50s. So you've got these French journals coming out that are competing with each other, and Cahiers du Cinéma, the film notebooks, yeah. starts in 1951. André Bazin and a couple of friends start this, this journal. And instead of hiring sort of the established critics, they start to hire these young kids, some of them in like 19, 18, 20, uh, to be critics. Because they're hearing them at these cine clubs and they're saying new stuff and they seem they're rabid about cinema. They're just kind of fascinated with it. So the French New Wave really kind of came out of a whole bunch of, of in, a new era, era of interest in cinema and also in, the, in other arts. The, you got the uh, new music is coming on in France. They're getting more interested in jazz and looking at other places. But you've got new, new, the new novel is coming out with Robe Grier and others. There's the new theater with Theater of the Absurd. And a lot of people are saying, gosh, there's a new wave generation, this new generation that doesn't always just look to accordion music and you know what, what, what their parents cared about. Um, and there's all this excitement from this generation in other arts, um, but nobody's really making too many movies that they're all praising. The p- stuff they praised was from 20, 30 years ago, Jean Renoir movies of the 30s and things like that. Um, so it led to people saying, we need to remake the cinema. And some of these critics, Jean-Luc Godard and Truffaut, I mean, they haven't made a movie yet, and they're, and they're attacking everybody who's popular. 
So they're yeah. attacking the equivalent of the Spielbergs and uh, and Nolans and I mean and and certainly Lucases of the world, saying they have too much money, they don't know how to make movies anymore, they just care about about generating box off dollar, office dollars. Uh, and they're same old stars. So it was a real frustration, and they really kind of pushed these guys aside and started their own their own movement. So what what motivated that them to to have that kind of audacity to think that they could go do this? <laughs> it's and, a good question. And challenge them, and then then they did it. Well, okay, take Francois Truffaut for example. Um, here's this kid who you know barely finished high school if he did, um, and was always in trouble, and Andre Bazan, the most important film critic in the country, adores him and becomes like his his stepfather almost. Hires him, and under and and Francois Truffaut in his early twenties becomes the most like read film critic in France. Um, so these guys and, and so are his buddies there. So they they have this young confidence that you know is pretty amazing when is for older guys to look back on. But when you think about being twenty three and somebody says, "Boy, you're the best at something," so they had this confidence to just attack people. Um, and they also had new technologies around them. Um, so they, I mean, Truffaut and, and his buddy Claude Chabrol, they're the first ones known to use a reel-to-reel tape recorder and go off and record and interview filmmakers. So they go up, they go and hang out in the hotel where they hear Alfred Hitchcock staying, and they catch him in the lobby and say, can we talk to you? So they, they were brash. They were brash, they were confident, and they also just felt like, look, we're not going to ask the usual questions. We don't want to know what it's like to you know, be with Grace Kelly in a movie. We want to know about your ideas of directing. And thanks to the critics of Andre Bazan, they cared about camera movement, they cared about lighting, they cared about storytelling in a way that no other film critics are doing that. In the United States, you know, look at 1950s at a film review. Yeah. It's usually about what kind of dress the, you know, Doris Day is wearing. Yeah. Uh, they don't really care about whether the lighting is good or the editing is discontinuous. So, they so it really led to the, it. They, they elevated yes. the cinema to an art. That's a good way of putting it. Overlooked. Elevated. Yeah, and they're also building an audience. So they're not only making movies, they're making movies after they're already writing criticism and complaining about movies. So, wow. see what I mean? Like they're, they're already sort of building an audience for their own films when they finally get a chance to make them in the later 50s. And that's, I guess that fuels why they were so experimental, because nobody was thinking about film in terms of its cinematic qualities and characteristics. So, like Godard, he was experimenting all the time. Right, and there are a lot of people, I would say, who are thinking that way, but they're kind of not isolated, but they're doing it in their own way. There are these great auteurs, so they are going to praise Ingmar Bergman, and they're going to praise uh, De Sica and Rossellini and the people they see as caring about the aesthetics. Okay. But it's going to be a cluster of people that really make it the wave. So, yeah, they're, they're cherry-picking around the world. Like, oh, who are okay. the great directors out there? The Mizuguchis and the Kurosawas. So they're saying, these guys are great auteurs. And everybody else that you might see on the movie marquee, most of them are, are just hacks. So they really set up, not only they start to really teach people why is it you should watch a Jean Renoir movie instead of maybe running to the latest popular film at the theaters. And then they start to say, oh... If we make movies, and once a couple of them got the chance to make films, they really felt this responsibility. But they also felt like, you know, they've already prepared their audience. And they had sort of people rooting for them, even before they, you know, <laughs> they'd yeah. seen their movies. They're like, I want to see Truffaut's new movie because he's, you know, I love reading his criticism. Uh, same thing with Godard. He was just audacious. I mean, just cruel as a critic sometimes. So people saying, well, let's see what he can make. So, so it's not like they were unknowns. They were first-time filmmakers, but a lot of people knew their names ahead of time from the critical reviews and cine clubs. So when, when Truffaut hit Hitchcock, is that the book that he made, Hitchcock Truffaut? That's later. Um, actually, and I think the first book ever written on Hitchcock is actually by Claude Chabrol and Eric Romer in the 50s. Truffaut did a lot of interviews with him. No, then it's really in, in, it's in the early 60s. And I would encourage anybody who ever wants to be a director or a writer, yeah, to read that Truffaut Hitchcock book. Oh, it's fascinating. And it's, it it's, it I, is, I, and yeah, there's, I, I new, there's that even a documentary. 
Yeah, it's it's an amazing book. book. It was a book that I got when I was in film school, and I've I've always had it nearby my side. It's it's a fantastic book. Well, the, oh, that's terrific! Because in the movie, in the documentary, they actually interview Wes Anderson, and he says, "Well, it's not a book anymore. It's just a pile of pages. It's just broken <laughs> apart." He's looked at it so many times, but that kind of close attention. I mean, Truffaut is at the peak of his career in the early '60s, and he takes a year off to go and write a book with Hitchcock. Oh, well, you know, people are trying to get him to make movies. He's like, you know, this is what he wanted to do, was talk th- with Hitchcock through every movie and how he made his artistic choices. And that's brilliant. We don't get critics doing that much anymore. Right. I was fascinated to learn also that, that uh, Truffaut got his father-in-law to purchase uh, Kalatozov's um, The Cranes Are Flying. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, now, Truffaut's an interesting guy, i got to admit. Um, but he, he did kind of exploit, you know, he marries this woman whose husband is, or whose father is a big distributor. But yeah, he knew what, he knew what was hot. You know, he was watching everything. That's a brilliant film. I love, that's one of my favorite Soviet films. Yeah. Oh, it's stunning. It's stunning. And yeah, it made so much money that that allowed him to, you know, be a little more open-minded to this kind of irritating, can you imagine him as a son-in-law? I don't know. But <laughs> Truffaut, um... And it, he made sure he talked to certain people, and they helped get some funding for him to make his first short, and then his 400 Blows, which made so much money that it just blew open the doors for everybody. The, the environment that they were working in, they, they faced so many limitations. I was really surprised yeah. by the financial limitations, the mm. fact that the film fund that would, or film aid that would give uh, the, the, the establishment money to do films a lot of these guys were restricted from that because they didn't have the thing uh, was they it a union thing or yeah they weren't being official in lots of different ways uh yeah so they really were on the the margins of the industry in lots of ways and on the one hand they wanted to be uh on the other hand they kind of wanted the stuff that that, that others could get and and pretty soon they got those tradi- those those loans low interest loans and grants uh for their films some of them but yeah, they're really working on the margins. And I think this is really important for anybody who wants to make a movie is just if somebody doesn't want to support you, you either have to decide, well, then I'll make something that I can do without that kind of support. And I think that's what's encouraging. I have all yeah. these students who want to make movies, yeah. and, and, you know, but they all want to make a Tarantino movie. Well, you know what? They've been made. Uh, or they want to make a Star Wars you know, on no budget. Yeah. And the point is, these guys didn't make costume dramas. They didn't make science fiction films. Or if they did like Godard, it's a goofball one that you just shoot on the streets. Yeah. Uh, they made movies they could do, yeah, cheaply. And they're hot. these are, you know, hip young guys. They had to shoot in black and white when they would have loved color. Color was this, you know, was, was what was realism around them. But yeah, they had to shoot in black and white and shoot cheap handheld cameras and with very little yeah try to evade the unions if they could but they had to use them just enough so they could legally show their movies and posting sound and yeah i was surprised to see that melville he was not even able to buy film stock not until yes well he and and okay what's really important is uh i think the new wave cluster of guys uh they looked to really good people as role models they loved Melville's films, but they also watched the problems they had. So, yeah, Melville had real trouble because he wasn't officially, he didn't have a, a union card, he didn't hire the union, he made a film on his own, didn't get permission from the person to, he adapted the book for, for Bob Flambeur, um, and other things initially. But basically, they're learning from their mistakes. The other person, the most important person in addition, I think, is Agnes Varda. I mean, she knew nothing about movies. She goes off and makes a feature film in her 20s. And, yeah, yeah she didn't care about unions. Yeah, La yeah. Pointe Courte, it's this, you know, the short point shot in southern France. And she makes this stunning movie like Melville did, and then she can't get it distributed because yeah. it counts as an amateur production. It didn't get the permission from the government to make it, yeah, much less the union things. So nobody would show it except in these few art houses. And then everybody starts to think, this is brilliant. And it worked, but they watched her movie, and then they realized, okay, we can't do Agnes's mistake here. We got, <laughs> we got to make sure we get permission from the state. The CNC is the organizing board, uh, and they give permission to make movies, and you have to meet a bunch of their conditions. Um, and so that's what 
they finally had to realize what are the minimum conditions and they'd argue well we don't really need a costume designer we can do that ourselves and so they could make cheaper films than the system wanted them to what was the significance of Bazan Andre Bazan was important on lots of levels one, I mean one just generally this is a guy who uh, he was he was a teacher it was his, what paid his bills initially and he got into writing film reviews in all kinds of journals uh, during the 1940s, during the war. Uh, he was a very progressive, but he was also a very religious person. He was a Catholic and a communist, uh, which you could be back then. Um, and, but he had this earnest belief that cinema was somehow close to the human spirit. Cinema could be opening worlds unto us. He just had a real faith in cinema as a progressive force of society and one of the great new art forms of the century. So he had a very, just a very sensitive style of writing criticism that, um, that just pulled people in, I think. And he, and he also then, as a person, uh, apparently he was the kind of guy who he couldn't like, drive through Paris. He was lucky enough to have a car without like, stopping on every corner where somebody's waiting in a, for a bus in the rain and saying, well, come ride with me. I mean, he was just a big, a big-hearted guy, and he helped all these young critics get into the industry. So he was, he was a very important critic. Uh, he championed auteurism. He thought everybody should find their own mise-en-scene, their own visual style. Right. So he would write great articles about movies that, like even some of the neorealist films that were being panned, he says, no, this is the great stuff. you got to watch De Sica. you got to watch Russell Lee. So he was champion for Jean Renoir and other directors from the 30s, who had been kind of overlooked by the end of the century, of the decade. Unfortunately, the online service that I used to record audio completely quit on me in the middle of this interview, and I had to scramble to get Professor Newport on the phone and get that phone call recorded. It's not the best audio, and I apologize for that, but we resume our conversation with this question, would the French New Wave be different without André Bazin? Um, but especially certain kinds of themes, that is, that sort of, you want to look for very humanistic themes that would be connected to the film style. So I think that really sort of shaped what these young critics were looking for. It was one thing to say, oh, there's, you know, there's, there's this, some, some great storytelling, but is the lighting and the camera work reinforcing it? Are they, you know, they really looked for this sort of whole package rather than just talking about what the main characters did in their reviews. So, so when they made movies, they really had the sense that they had to live up to sort of the Bazanian reputation of stories and style that are just inseparable. You can't imagine shooting that scene in a different way. And when Trupo wrote articles, I mean, his, some of his first reviews, he would actually criticize and say, you know, look, one scene is pretty good, and then they move the camera in a way that just, you know, undercuts it. So they really cared, and they were thinking about Writing reviews were just like making movies. So when they got the chance to make movies, they tried to do it in a way that kind of began, whether he was alive or dead, uh, he died so young. Um, but that it's something that so they were inspired by him that he would have liked. So yes, I think he, he made a huge effect on their lives, um, but also just their aesthetics, that theme and style have to work together. Yeah. What can filmmakers today learn from the French New Wave? What should we be learning from them? I think the first lesson of the French New Wave is tell stories that matter to you. Not think about an audience, not worry about certain kinds of genres. Uh, they tell personal stories. That, I mean, so a lot of these people, I mean, they're, they're not only shooting cheap movies, but they're shooting them in their neighborhoods where they live. They're using their own apartments. Um, you know, even the actors, sometimes they're like a friend's girlfriend, you know, plays the girlfriend in the movie. Um, they did real personal things that they cared about. So I think that's one of the things. Um, looking for fresh kind of storytelling is really important. That is, they're aware of how other people did movies and they're aware of film history, but they're trying then to synthesize things into something that's personal. So if you look at the French New Wave, um, whether it's Agnes Barda or whether it's Ellen René and Hiroshima Monamour, um, whether it's Francois Truffaut or Jean-Luc Godard, their movies don't look alike, 
right? But they're all in the same group because they're all trying to tell their own personal kind of tales and find a style that fits their movies. And all of those avoid the cliches of mainstream genre film. And that's another Bazan thing. Bazan just said, look, whether Hollywood's telling an adventure story, a love story, or a musical, they're all edited the same. You start with an establishing shot, you go to a two shot, you go to a shot reverse shot. So that's why for him that was like that equilibrium of the river. It's just gotten boring. So they all found different ways. So Truffaut might use incredibly long takes in 400 blows in certain places. And Jean-Luc Godard might use jump cuts in his first feature, Breathless. But they're both very new way because they're telling sort of contemporary tales that tie into their lives, that find a lively new kind of storytelling, a new kind of film style that doesn't look like mainstream Hollywood or mainstream French cinema at the time. I, think, I just think it's inspiring to think of yeah, how to tell good new stories um, and a story for your age. Yeah, you it, live in. I totally agree with that. I totally. I mean, the Hollywood has gotten so formulaic now. All the screenwriting books that are being pumped out by all these teachers basically are all the same thing. Yeah, the McKee style, three yeah. three act or four act. Yeah. Well, in fact, I would I would recommend. I, I mean, I do think much of American independent cinema was, of course, inspired by the French New Wave. I mean, even things like The Graduate and Bonnie and Clyde and those things uh, have references to the New Wave in them. But, um, but it's really the 1980s on, the big new independent cinema stuff, they look back to these people, too, as, as role models. And there are a couple of good, you mentioned books. Um, my good friend J.J. Murphy has a great book on script writing in new independent cinema. Oh, really? Uh, it's about, all about me and you, and, uh, you know, and it's, it's a really good book about looking at script writing in movies like Elephant and movies like um, You and Me and Everyone We Know. Uh, but what makes them so different? It's they're different from the script on. It's not just that the, the story, the story itself. They actually rethink what should a script do. Uh, they rethink what kind of actor and actress should we use. Um, but everything is kind of rethought from the ground up. And I think that's a lesson that the new wave should should teach people. Just because somebody's got a good name doesn't mean they're a good actor for your movie. Right. Yeah, Star Wars sort of changed everything. They they used to invest in personal films before Star Wars, and then after Star Wars, everything had to be a blockbuster. Yeah, well, at least, yes, especially if you go through the mainstream, and that's one of the things I think the New Wave kind of taught is they made their own movies. They didn't need to use studio people. They didn't need to say who's the best cinematographer and highest paid. They must be the one I need. Instead, they trained their own. They found friends. They trained their own cinematographers. They said, look, I only got a little bit of money. How am I going to get this shot done? And then you got cinematographers saying, geez, why don't we use a wheelchair? Yeah. They're like, what? You know, that's unprofessional. And once they do that in Breathless and a couple other movies, every film school in America said, oh, I can just put my camera operator in a wheelchair and push him down the sidewalk? Yeah. Uh, that would have been silly and unprofessional. Now it was cool. So the idea of sort of rethinking how to use technology in a digital age, you shouldn't take a small digital camera and want it to look like Casablanca you know, or, uh, or even a North by Northwest. You know, it's, it's yeah. a different kind of piece of equipment. And, and I think filmmakers today should think about how should I use a small digital camera differently uh, than somebody who had a big Mitchell camera in the 1940s. Right. We actually got it better today than they had it back then just because of the technology is so much cheaper. Oh, yeah. it's... Anybody can make a movie. Anybody can load it up on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, that's true. But if you want other people to see it, you still have to go usually through one of the big gatekeepers. Do you, do you know of any movements happening today where we're sort of bypassing the gatekeepers and and? Um... Um, I, that's a good question. Um, I don't. I mean, yes, I, I think there are a whole bunch of people who are making like avant garde and, and different kinds of things, and and but I don't know that there's a movement. I think it's just sort of, and a lot of times it's just calling cards. People who want to get something made, so then they get accepted by Hollywood. Yeah. Or they can sell their big project. Right. Um, I don't know that there's a movement like this again, and I don't know that there would be. But um, but I think in, in third world countries, yes. I mean, there's a bunch of places there that people are sort of shooting in the streets, and even even in India and Vietnam, there's some. You know, but there's not like a movement. Uh, sometimes it's, they're just forced to because of, of the con context. Do you know of any filmmakers who are who, who are working today who have that sensibility who are working in similar yeah. ways? As yeah. I saw um, yes, I think things like the Florida Project, 
um, and Tangerine, uh, Sean, oh no, I can't think of his last name, um, Baker, Sean Baker's, um, I think movies like uh, The Florida Project, yeah. uh, which all takes place in this rundown motel, um, is a really good example of, wow. of, of people like that. Yeah, and Tangerine, he shot it on an iPhone. Uh, it's upsetting, maybe. It's, it's an upsetting film in some ways, but it's also just hilarious and, and beautiful. And he says, okay, I'm going to make a movie with, about these sort of transvestites who work on, live on the streets. You know, I'm not going to shoot it with classical Hollywood style. I'm going to just shoot it with an iPhone, like I'm a passerby. Huh. So I think I think people like that are, are real exciting right now. So what are the books do you think are helpful to read about the French New Wave and, and get an understanding, like Bazin's writings or... Are there articles? It's really good as a background, certainly. Um, I do think, uh, and, and Andre, uh, um, uh, Dudley Andrew has a book about Bazan that's got a nice intro that's an older book. Um, and the Michelle Marie book really is very short. Um, I translated it, but I don't get any royalties at this point or anything. Um, <laughs> so, but the Michelle Marie book is like, you know, it's about new bodies, it's about new ways of producing, it's about new scripts. I think it's a, it's a, it's a very good overview. Wow. What about the articles from Caillou du Cinema? Yeah, Kaye, some of it's been translated um, in uh, in a couple different books. So the, yeah, there's Kaye of the 50s, Kaye of the 60s. I think reading the Kaye of the 1950s is really fascinating um, as well, Jim Hillier's collection. So yeah, that stuff's terrific. Um, certainly if you can't read in French, the, the Hillier is, is a really good way to go. There's actually a brand new Canadian translation of Andre Bazin's What is Cinema? Um, but because Berkeley has the rights in America, they can't sell it here. But Canada has a great new Andre Bazin collection, actually. For for somebody who's not really uh, exposed to the French New Wave, what do you what would be some of the first films you would uh, recommend they look oh, at? I, I think starting with, with Truffaut is the best. And um, my wife's a French liter- uh, French uh, professor, and you know she teaches it in her conversation classes. I think starting at the beginning with things like uh, uh, the Four Hundred Blows. Shoot the Piano Player is a really, you know, a, a great, I think, look at how a movie knows the Hollywood rules but is breaking all of them. Yeah. For the second movie. Yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, and then Jules and Jim. I mean, I think I think three movies in a row would be the first three true foes. Four okay. foes, Shoot the Piano Player, and Jules and Jim. He, uh, he had such an energy in Jules and Jim. I was surprised. Yes. It, was, it was almost contemporary. Yeah, it also shows the variety that this young guy is using. His first film, Four Hundred Blows, the Catholic Church gave it one of their top honors because uh, it showed you sort of you know how children need a, fa- a loving family, and he doesn't have one. And then his third film it was condemned by the Catholic Church because there's this sort of uh, you know, love tri- a trio, yeah, uh, as well. And then certainly uh, my favorite film is Breathless. Still, I think Godard's Breathless, you can't beat it. Um, is really stunning. I'd also really encourage people that the most uh, the most important woman filmmaker ever, I think, in history is Agnes Varda and her Cleo from Five to Seven and Le Bonheur, Happiness, Le Bonheur are both just marvelous movies. Yeah. Um, and then also Ellen Renee. Some people don't put him in the new wave and say, well, he's in this left bank group. But Hiroshima Moon and Moore is one of the most moving and difficult movies at the same time. I think it's it's really stunning. Yeah, it is moving and very... And so it's a good place to start, I think. And even Louis Miles, Elevator to the Gallows, it's, it was just before the new wave. Yeah. But he was Louis, Louis Miles, Elevator to the Gallows. He's going to, you know, he starts his own company. Um, he uses new actors and makes stars out of them, like Jean Moreau. Uh, he's got this jazzy soundtrack. A lot of that stuff is going to really affect not just the French New Wave, but really the next 10 years of French filmmaking. Yeah. So one of the, the comments I'm always getting from my family when I'm watching one of these films is, why are we watching them do that for so long, you know? And there's even shots yeah. where they'll get in the car and they'll have the camera running while they're going from point A to point B across town, and it doesn't stop. <laughs> it's no, it's very true, and and I will say some of the stuff seems dated now because I mean it's sixty years old or fifty five years old. Um, but a lot of times, yeah, they're trying to have you sort of do that Bazanian spectatorship of sort of just watching people and watch for subtleties. Okay. Which is something that yeah. most mainstream films weren't already doing. They would just cut, cut, cut. Um, so, yeah, that notion of, again, embedding you in their time, embedding in that space, and also calling attention to the soundtracks. A lot of times they're recording on, you know, like live direct sound and then mixing things in later. So they really want you to see and hear from their new perspectives. Now, the nice thing about a lot of the new wave films is they didn't have a lot of money, so they weren't making three-hour movies. Yeah. Uh, Jacques Rivette tried all the time. But in general, they're really quick and fun. Yeah. And if people need to respite from the new wave, 
Dave? You watch Umbrella's a show? Oh, no doubt. Jacques Demy in that full color and singing, and um, unfortunately his musician just died as well. Um, but but yes, so I, th- I think there's there's some great surprises in there to watch as well. Professor Newpert, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for giving me your time and your your wealth of knowledge on this and sharing your passion. This is this is exciting. I really I really enjoyed this. Sure, this has been great. I yes, just, you know if I can do anything or help, you know, fill in any gaps, let me know. I will do that. Thank you, Mr. Newpert. All right, thanks, Doug. All right, bye bye. I thoroughly enjoyed this interview with Professor Newpert. And at some point in the future, I may invite him back to talk about specific directors and films from the French New Wave. You'll find links to the books recommended by Professor Newport in the show notes of this episode. And over the next few weeks, I'll be posting more information about the French New Wave on the website. Let me know if you've enjoyed this episode in the comments section of this podcast at the Ministry of Motion Pictures.org. In our next episode, the Executive Vice President of Affirm Films, Mr. Richard Peluso, will join me to talk about his experience in Christian film. Thank you for joining me on the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast. You'll find show notes and more information about us at www.ministryofmotionpictures.org. What we do in life echoes in eternity.